Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, hi, this is Citanium, and last year I did a video that was every game I played from 2019 ranked from best to worst. And it did pretty well, people seemed to like it fine, and uh, it gave me a chance to kind of go through basically every game that was released that year that I happened to play. And I was going to do that as another video where I stood in front of a camera and explained in detail each one of those, going down the entire list, and I did record all of that, and then found out later that the audio sounded like I had a jet engine behind me, and I have absolutely no idea why. And you will note that there are a considerable number of big release titles that are not on this list at all, uh, because I did not play them. If I had not played them, I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, also, I ended up playing more games that came out in 2020 since I recorded that, so instead we're going to do it in this form. I'm just going to do this voiceover in audio form for everybody, and uh, we're going to talk about every single one of those games, and I'm going to run down the list for you. Okay, everybody got this straight? Terrific. So, let's jump right into it. This is every game I played from 2020 ranked best to worst. Number one is probably not going to come as any surprise for anyone who has been kind of following what I've been doing this year. It is Wasteland 3. Uh, if you are interested in CRPGs or tactic-based combat or really were disappointed by maybe what has happened with the Fallout franchise in recent years, Wasteland 3 is definitely going to scratch that post-apocalyptic itch. It does a good job of being quirky but also having great character development. And I feel like you're going to get a lot of uh, great RPG moments. There are literally moments where you do have to decide between doing one mission or another mission. And if you don't get to the other one, there's going to be a lot of people that die. And you have to figure out which one you consider a true priority. It's got some amazing factions, some really surrealistic moments, some amazing writing, great voice acting. Uh, it's got just a, a wonderful wonderful pedigree from in exile and it does a great job looking forward to more the couple flaws that i had found in it were uh, about like you know there were glitches when the game first came out and the load screens were very long especially for what i i thought the game was now in exile has been doing a lot to try and rectify those problems and it has been mitigated to a great degree if you are on console you might still notice some but on a pc i don't think you're going to worry about load screens anymore it's really not a problem and it's a great experience from start to finish. I have not even gotten a chance to do two-thirds of the game, and it feels like I've already gotten my money's worth. Number two, yeah, if anything was going to top Wasteland 3, if anything even had the chance to do so in my mind, it would be my number two pick, and that is Spirit Fair. The amazing thing about Spirit Fair is that it's not really combat-based at all. You can't die because technically your character is already supposed to have died. Um, but the emotional part of the game, where it's about death and yet there's so much life to it, is terrific. Being able to build out this fairy, essentially... That you, uh, that you can grow stuff on and do like mini missions as you're going across this landscape uh, and, you know, helping these animals that are, are spirits of people that you knew when you were alive and the lore that goes into it that they don't even explain in the game. Is, is just terrific, and of course, when you finally do, like, celebrate, essentially, each single one of these characters, and who they are, and learn more about them, and, and, and help them out in their individual quests, and stuff like that, and then eventually have to come to the realization at the end that, yes, there is going to be a moment where your time with them is through, and you have to shepherd them off to the next phase of their existence, essentially sit, sending them off into the afterlife, is just an emotional roller coaster all the way up to the very end where you have that one last ever door that you have to go through and uh, yeah it it that's that's a hard moment it is fascinating to see a game especially from a small developer that can be 
uh, both so charming and lively and fun and also have those moments of utter emotional devastation. But Spiritfarer succeeds in that. And I should also mention, my goodness, the art style is incredible. That hand-drawn art style that they give you in Spiritfarer is beautiful. Just simply marvelous. And, and that soundtrack is so ambient and almost haunting as you're playing, that it, it just lends itself to suck you right into the entire experience. Terrific game. Number three, I, I did have some criticisms of it, but I cannot deny that Gears Tactics is one of the best tactics-based games I have played. I couldn't necessarily tell you it's as good as XCOM, but what it does, it does very well. I liked the fact that they actually allowed you to have... Overwatch done in multiple steps. If you have like three actions left, it means you get three Overwatch shots. If you so, if you hunker down, you might actually be able to utilize it more uh, as a defensive measure than you could in games like XCOM. Also, the idea of having cones of visibility really does make you think tactically about where you want to move your people around the map. I like the different character classes. I like what they are able to do. I like uh, the skill trees that they put in place and that you can have like two scouts, but they can be built in completely different ways to do completely different tasks. That kind of functionality and customization really lends itself well. I would have liked to see a little bit more open-endedness to being able to, you know, maybe choose more missions and, and jut around the map a little bit more like you could in XCOM. But what they do is provide a really nice customizable experience that goes through a few different acts that has some uh, gear that you can level up and customize as well, as well as your character. And it does a fantastic job at what it sets out to do. Number four really has to be Call of the Sea. One, because I don't feel enough people got a chance to even play. That is an absolute shame because it is a beautiful game. Not a particularly long game, I can't claim that. But what I can say is that it is a fantastic, very richly animated, colorful game set in the 1940s on this mysterious island. It's got, it's got all of that classic adventure flair to it. But then, on top of that, has these really wonderful, almost organic puzzles that are going into this as Nora's trying to figure out what happened to her husband and the expedition that came out to this island trying to figure out how to cure her mysterious disease. Um, the puzzles are really interesting, and the, and the experience of just going through this world is just so enjoyable that it's hard not to recommend it if you have not gotten a chance to pick it up or if you did not even know it existed. It really is... Uh, fantastic and great if you're with friends too. If you're a backseat gamer, this was your game of the year. Number five is a game that has a title far too long for its own good, but Dragon Quest XI's Echoes of an Elusive Age Definitive Edition uh, is technically a game that I guess came out a few years back, but this particular edition came out this year, so it's going to get put on the list, and I have not gotten a chance to play any Dragon Quest games since the original one that came out on the NES, and I can tell you that I was always looking forward to it, but never seemed to have the right platform. Well, anyway, uh, Dragon Quest XI is a real surprise for me, because it is a, a JRPG, and usually I'm not big on those, but the great thing about Eleven is that it almost has a tongue-in-cheek attitude about the conventions of JRPGs. It just kind of revels in having quirky names and character designs for not just your protagonist, but also for all of the enemies and monsters and things that you meet in the game. And while having a story that is somewhat serious has a lot of characters that are just so over the top that it's hard to take the thing too seriously in general. And I think it likes it that way. It is the other Square Enix epic RPG series that is not Final Fantasy, and yet it has definitely impressed upon me that it is its own thing. It is incredibly long. The combat is actually very satisfying, even though it is turn-based, and some people might find it to be a little bit more... 
um, slow than if it was in real time, but it, it doesn't belabor the point when you're playing it. I, uh, I thought that they did a fantastic job, and it's just a lot of fun. Number six is Torchlight 3. I was a fan of Torchlight when it originally came out. I didn't really get the chance to play Torchlight 2, but as far as, like, Diablo clones go, Torchlight's kind of up there, like, you know, right behind Diablo in terms of quality. And I was very impressed with Torchlight 3. Uh, obviously, I get to play... Um, uh, a steampunk robot is uh, one of the character designs, the forged, and uh, that is obviously what I did because I can like shoot coal out of a furnace in my belly. And if that isn't enough of a selling point for you, I don't know what is. There's a you know color coded gear system like you usually see in the action RPG, you know top down hack and slash kind of genre, but it's done. Uh, very well. There's a lot of lively, colorful stuff going on here. If you were to think of this in terms of like compare and contrast to a Diablo, uh, Diablo has a tendency to be a little bit darker and rougher and, and a little bit more violent, gory. The, the character designs are, you know, a little grotesque when you get to the enemies. A torchlight instead wants to make uh, the enemies almost seem cuddly in a lot of ways. They're very animated, and there's there's more of a cartoonish atmosphere to it. But it's still the kind of experience that you're hoping for if you really enjoyed uh, a Diablo. You still have that ARPG goodness wrapped up in this very colorful, more uh, you know fairy tale looking game. Number seven on my list is uh, Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning, because it's Kingdoms of Amalur, obviously, and uh, that was, like, one of my favorite games of 2010. But it is also the kind of game that I fear does not get a lot of notice. Like, maybe it has gone under the radar for anybody who has just gotten into gaming in the last five, six years. But for people who remember it, remember it very fondly. And... It is, uh, has great pedigree in terms of the people that did the storyline and the music and the, the character designs and everything. And I won't get into all of that here. You probably already know those stories. But, um, I mean, it's Kim Kingdoms of Amalur. And the thing that I really appreciated about it was that it is the complete edition. So if you didn't get a chance to play, like, uh, Legend of Dead Kel or Teeth of Naros, or maybe you didn't get the different weapon packs, well, that's all included right in it. And apparently there's also going to be some upcoming... Uh, Fate Sworn as a, a new piece of content. That's terrific. Uh, it looks very good, um, and I think the big selling point, especially for Alex, was the idea that you had those FOV sliders. And for me, I really love the fact that I could actually pull the camera away now, so that like my, maybe my character was pretty small, but I could see so much of the landscape around me, and and it didn't give me quite as much nausea when the camera panned around. Uh, so I did appreciate those nice little tweaks that they gave you, uh, a, a little bit more customization. The thing is that this would probably be higher up on the list, I except for the fact that, truthfully, it's not really all that different from the original besides those nice little tweaks and add-ons that they gave. Uh, the base experience, uh, because I went back and played like a little bit of the original Kingdoms of Amalur afterward, after I got a chance to toy around with Re-Reckoning, and I was like, yeah, there's not a whole lot that's really different from this new version, and uh, I fear that, you know, maybe they were just trying to, you know, introduce it to a new generation and maybe not take as much time to do as much as they might be able to. But, I mean, it's still Kingdoms of Amalur, and it's a great game, and if you had not gotten a chance to play it before, this is a great time to do so. Number eight is Journey to the Savage Planet, and I might have given people some idea when I talked about it on Citanium Mind that it is a little too in love with itself. That is actually true. It is very much in love with itself. But there is a lot to enjoy about this game. There's a lot to enjoy about it if you like Metroidvania-style games. It's not a particularly long game. Uh, it's not a particularly deep game. Yes, the commercials get a little bit annoying, but I did enjoy the platforming sections. I did enjoy being able to go back to different areas as you unlock new skills and abilities, and they did a very good job with that. It's not really the best thing that you will ever play, but it is a, a great new IP, and I will be interested to see what they do with it into the future if they want to continue down this path. 
Number nine, I'm kind of putting it this high on the list just because of the potential it has down the road, which I know is there and I know is going to come. And that is Grounded. Grounded is a game from Obsidian, which has a very good pedigree. They, they're, they're batting a thousand, but... Uh, when it first came out, it might have seemed a little bit sparse. That didn't stop me from enjoying the very idea of basically, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but a game. I really enjoyed that, the idea of being a kid and being down in the grass, using grass blades and twigs as your construction materials so that you can fend off, you know, ladybugs and ants and stuff. And of course, the spiders. The spiders stink. I hate spiders in this game. I, I, I don't really have arachnophobia like I used to, but um, the spiders are just an annoyance to no end. They're practically just steamrollers on you. But the fact that they've been adding a lot of content in there, uh, it's the kind of game that I say, I think people should really play it, but hold off on doing it just yet. Wait till there's a lot more there, and they've expanded the storyline out, and I think you're going to really enjoy it, and I'm sure it's a lot of fun, especially if you have like a four-player co-op going on. I think you're going to love it. 10 is Carrion. I, I think the reason I wanted to put Carrion up here on the list was because it's just so wonderfully innovative. As you play this big meat monster, essentially with teeth, that's going around a facility doing essentially a reverse alien. You are the monster. You are trying to escape the facility where you have been contained. You want your freedom, and you will eat everyone in your path if you need to. It is deliciously um, subversive in the way that it is presented to the players. Uh, it is super satisfying, you know, running through the vents as this creature. Uh, and there's just something darkly humorous about the whole experience. It is a, a Metroidvania kind of style game, but it definitely has its own stuff going on for it, especially the idea that uh, there are benefits to being small or medium or large that allow you to get into different areas and give you different abilities. That was very innovative. It's not the best kind of Metroidvania that you could ask for, but in terms of originality, it gets very high marks. Number 11 is Haven. Uh, one, Haven is a beautiful looking game, and two, Haven is a lovely idea for a game. You're playing this couple that has had to get away from a society where they were going to be matched with somebody else that they did not love, and they just figured that they loved each other enough that it was worth taking a risk and trying to escape the bounds of that society to this distant planet that seems like it's got some things going wrong with it, but we're going to make a go of it on our own. It's kind of the classic, you know, just a small town boy and just a small town girl and don't stop believing. And that's kind of the storyline of Haven. And it works very well. They have sort of a, a pseudo turn-based combat that's uh, like on timers. And you don't really even kill the animals that are on the planet. It's just that they're infected with this rust and you have to get the rust off of them. And then they're happy that you did that. So yay you, 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 you cleanse them of the rust. It's terrific to actually watch the relationship when you go back to like the home base and you can do cooking recipes together and strengthen their relationship and that's how you level up. I think the problem with it was just that it has uh, a bit of repetitive nature to it. So you end up doing the same thing over and over again. Here's a new section. I got to clean the rust out and uh, then I, I guess we're, we're good here. Have I found like a beacon that continues the story? Okay, let's move on to the next area and cleanse that. But in terms of just the, the look and the style and the idea of this relationship between the two characters being formed and bonded even further as the game goes along, being the catalyst to create like the storyline, I thought was just terrific. Number 12, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. I'm going to tell you that I wasn't a huge fan of the original Ori. Uh, and it's mostly because while it's beautiful to look at, it's got great music, got really neat characters, has a really neat storyline, like everything should be fine. There's this point in Ori in the Blind Forest where you just want to rage quit 
because the platforming elements all of a sudden just start to become so laboriously difficult. I wish I could tell you that Ori and the Will of the Wisp was different. It is not. There is a point about five, six hours in where I had to try and juggle this ball of lava from like one side of a map to another side of the map, and I couldn't figure out how they wanted me to do it, and it was very, very frustrating, and I don't know what they wanted me to do, and I gave up. And that's the problem, is that Ori and the Will of the Wisps, like the previous game, it has so much great stuff going for it, but will turn a lot of players off by having this just super difficulty spike at a certain point that will just drive you nuts. It's not like even a slow increase. It's just all of a sudden like, yeah, yeah, I get this, I get this, okay, that was good, and then all whoop, off into the sky. And uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, I did, I like the owl, though. I'll give you that. I like the owl. Number 13, Doom Eternal. I didn't actually play Doom Eternal very much, honestly. For the time that I was playing it, I was like, yep, this is Doom. It's id. They are, they are you know, moving at, at a super silky frame rate. The gameplay is super solid. I really enjoy that. It's, it looks great. They've, they've done some great stuff with it, don't get me wrong. But... It is also kind of a frustrating mess, and I don't really understand quite why so many people were on top of it. I think if you're like uh, the kind of person that loves Dark Souls, you're probably interested in doing like a Doom or a Doom Eternal. But a lot of things just frustrated me out of the gate. Like, for instance, I didn't really like the fact that I had to put gas into my chainsaw all the time. Why wasn't the chainsaw just the melee weapon. I would have loved that. I could have just tried to run up to every monster and tried to chainsaw them, and what would be the problem with that? And the ammo counts, you know, not constantly running out of ammunition. It's just the kind of thing where you'll get to a point where you're like, why am I doing this? It's not that it isn't fun. It's not that it isn't, you know, well designed as a shooter. I think that as far as shooting design goes, you can't get much better than this, but beyond that, you're going to ask yourself some of those same questions. And so, great if you liked the previous Dooms, and if you are big on the, the pure FPS shooter genre. If you are not, though, you're probably not going to want to play it. Number 14 was a game I got to play kind of in early access when it first came out, and that's Ooblets. The reason why I think fondly of Ooblets was because it basically tried to do Stardew Valley and Pokemon at the same time. And I have to give them some credit just for the idea of having essentially Ooblet dance battles be the combat system. That's terrific. Also, as far as the, you know, a farming aspect of the game, I really appreciated that you had all of your tools essentially unlocked at the beginning and you didn't have to switch between them. It's a it's a little thing, but it was something that always annoyed me in like Stardew Valley where, okay, I got to figure out where my pick is. Now I got to figure out where my shovel is. And this is all contact sensitive. So you basically, you go up to a rock, you pull out your pick. You go to, you know, hoe out something and you, you pull out your hoe and you, you know, pull out your axe if you're going to chop a tree. I like the fact that they just did that. I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, some of the characters are going to get a little bit annoying over the course of time. I, I can definitely feel that immediately uh, when I started playing it. But uh, nice ideas incorporated into this. And uh, yeah, you got to give credit to anything that's willing to do dance battles as the actual combat system. Good stuff. Number 15 is Eichenfell. I know a lot of people actually really loved Eichenfell, and I understand that. I think I can. Um, the pixel graphic art style wasn't bad. Um, the concept of having essentially like, you know, your, your Harry Potter Hogwarts experience where something has gone terribly wrong and you don't even know if your character has magical powers and then she discovers that she has magical powers and she has to go and find out what happened to her sister. That's all really neat. I like that. And people might enjoy the battle system. But for me, that's really where the game kind of started to fall apart was the battle system. Um, there's, there's a grid. You're on that grid. You're going up to the other guy and, and trying to figure out where your attacks will hit. It's sort of like a grid-based strategy RPG, and sometimes I like that. I think that when they did, you know, South Park, The Fractured But Whole, it worked very well. The problem with Eichenfell is that 
it doesn't want to just stop there, where it would be perfectly fine for them to stop. But then they also have to add in some Paper Mario uh, QuickTime button pressing to figure out if it's effective or not. And what you start to realize very quickly is that you are going to have to know that you need to press the buttons correctly on your turn and then also press the buttons correctly on the defensive end when the uh, you know monsters are attacking you and trying to figure out when that attack is actually going to hit and when you're supposed to hit those buttons gets very frustrating very quickly and that's the reason why it's not higher up on the list. Number 16 is an attempt at doing basically Super Mario Maker, but not from Nintendo, and that's Level Head. I had a little fun playing Level Head, I got to admit. Um, I liked being able to try out some of the other levels people had made. I tried making some myself. I have to tell you, though, that like a lot of like Super Mario Maker levels, people want to make you feel pain that you can't do the same kind of course that, <laughs> that they can. And uh, I tried making one of those levels, but it's the kind of thing that if you're a big platforming fan, you'll probably love it. Otherwise, you might want to skip it. I, I don't know if it really does anything above and beyond what Super Mario Maker or even maybe Little Big Planet does. But the effort was uh, worth consideration. Let's put it to you that way. Uh, 17 is West of Dead. Now, here's the best pitch I can give you for West of Dead. It's uh, it's a roguelike that's like set in the underworld where you're an undead gunslinger that's voiced by Ron Perlman. You're probably ready to go out and buy it now. And you know what? Good for you. Uh, it's not that it's a bad game. It's mostly that roguelike aspect that I have to really tell you about because you'll unlock different stuff as you go through the game, but you don't get to keep it. And that's, for me, a problem, because it just becomes randomized, sort of like Enter the Gungeon. That's the kind of game that it is. It looks really cool, and it's, it, it's a neat concept, but when you get into the playtime, I like being able to flip over tables and, and do the gunslinging thing when you're in the individual rooms and everything like that. But you find that there is a real big problem when it gets down to the melee aspect of it, because when uh, any of those monsters close the distance to you, you are screwed. You are just screwed out of the gate. And there was that kind of problem for me that, like, on, on a level of ranged gunslinging combat works real well in melee. It's just insane. And so I can't really recommend it unless you really like roguelikes. In the 18 spot, we have another Western called Desperados 3. I think the reason why Desperados 3 fell short for me was just because it wasn't quite the game I originally thought it was supposed to be. I kind of felt like maybe it was almost like an XCOM kind of style game, you know, like a, a tactical game, but set in the, in the Wild West. And wouldn't that be neat, right? Yeah, it sure would. It's not, it's not that. It's, it's not that. It's actually like a real-time strategy game that takes you from level to level to level. Um, and it's, it works. I can tell you that it does work, and there's some neat stuff in it. But I didn't really feel connected to any of the characters. I did the train robbery part where you're trying to take out the outlaws and stuff. And, you know, you have to do some timing, and it's it definitely got some stealth elements to it because if you alert everybody, you're in trouble. But there's just something about trying to do a real-time strategy game that has stealth elements where you're trying to control multiple characters that just feels like you're trying to do a lot. Too much in some respects. And it's great if you like that kind of genre, but it's not something that's going to change your mind on the genre if you were not already on board for it. Number 19 is Star Wars Squadrons. It's not that Star Wars Squadrons is necessarily a bad game, but I'm putting it this far down because I think that it's really built for a multiplayer experience. And I was playing the single player, and I like to play single player, and so it probably was not geared toward me. On the outset, I was really super excited because I remember playing games like X-Wing or Rogue Squadron, right? These were really good games. These were super fun flights, 
combat simulators. Squadrons takes you into the cockpit, uh, so that's a little bit different than Rogue Squadron, but probably similar to X-Wing for you, and gives you some nice stuff that you can do. Um, but I have to say that it is the kind of game that is definitely trying to gear itself for a multiplayer experience because the single player didn't really grab me. In similar fashion, number 20 on the list is Deep Rock Galactic, another game that is probably a whole lot more fun if you have three friends playing with you. I did it by myself. They do allow you to play it in single player. Uh, and hey, I mean, the idea of being dwarves, going through uh, a landscape uh, of tunnels, and it's all procedurally generated, and you're trying to get ore so that you can get money and level up your characters. It's a neat idea, but it is definitely geared to be a party game, not a single-player experience. And it feels like the single-player experience was very much a tacked-on add-on. And that's unfortunate. But if you want a party game, you're probably going to love this thing. Number 21 is Star Renegades, which is also sort of a roguelike, but the thing that's neat about it is that it's turn-based and you can increase the relationships between you and your other characters, which gives passive bonuses and other some special moves as time goes on. And that's a neat idea. It's just not something that necessarily grabbed me beyond the initial concept. And that's unfortunate. I, I like the idea, but it's not really anything to write home about for me. Number 22 is The Tourist, which again is one of these very conceptually interesting ideas of being this tourist out on the islands, trying to enjoy a relaxing time away. But the thing is, is that the game really is built around the idea of uncovering the secrets of these monuments from one place to another. And so the, the other stuff sort of falls to the background because it really is in service of doing that. And so I don't really know if it will grab the average gamer because you might actually like the idea of just having an island vacation and then there's some other mysteries going on behind the surface. It really focuses more on those mysteries right out of the gate. So it didn't grab me. Sort of like I'm, I'm going to be talking about the next few games as we get further down this list. It's Games might have had some interesting ideas, but not necessarily things that I liked. Speaking of which, number 23 is Crusader Kings 3. It's not that Crusader Kings 3 is badly made. It's that it is so overly complicated that it will turn a lot of people that like strategy games off. If you look at the main interface for the game, you are going to see buttons all over the place. There's buttons on the left, there's like buttons on the right, there's buttons on the bottom, there's tabs on the top, there's uh, so much information that it just throws at you immediately. And some people are going to get real deep into the weeds with this and love it. I did not. I did not like it. And the reason is because that's too much complexity out of the gate. When, the, when it becomes difficult to finish the tutorial because you're scratching your head about what the game wants you to do and how the game works, I'm out. I have to be out because I'm not going to enjoy my experience with it past that. 24 is Coffee Talk. Again, really neat idea of having like a modern fantasy world that has elves and dwarves and orcs and all of that, and you being a barista at a coffee house where you have to listen to people's interactions and determine what kind of lovely beverage you should give them and then making that beverage. It's a neat concept for a game. Very cool concept that I got bored with very easily. And so it's this far down the list. Sorry. Sorry for the people that want to serve uh, an espresso to an orc. This is the game that you're going to want. But for me, that was not exactly on my bucket list. Number 25 is cross code. Again, fascinating concept of trying to do essentially Legend of Zelda, but really focusing on like the room by room dungeon exploration parts, which is really the main focus of the game and doing it in like a futuristic kind of fantasy setting. Neat stuff. Again, kind of boring for me. 
and I did not care much for the characters, so I wasn't really interested in playing any further. 26. Okay, so th this is the point where I have to talk about Minecraft Dungeons. Yes, it is this far down the list, and it's been on the bottom of a lot of people's lists, and I, I have to tell you, on the outset, it's not that, that it's a quote-unquote bad game. It's not a bad game, but it is very mediocre. It's boring. The reason why it's boring is because if you like Minecraft and being able to explore and build stuff and be super creative with your game, then you should just play Minecraft. If you like Diablo, being able to have an action RPG where you're building out your character and you're going on this epic quest, play Diablo. Or, as I mentioned earlier in this, uh, in this episode, Torchlight 3, which is also a great ARPG. Um, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to take that really freeform creativity of a Minecraft and mesh it with the very straightforward shoot a bunch of things in a dungeon model of a Diablo. These are two very different things and putting them together doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, playing as, like Steve, the Minecraft guy, in a, a Diablo-style game doesn't really seem to work for me. I found it odd that my upgrades were on my weaponry uh, I, I was like, well, then you're going to have to change your strategy all the time. I guess they've actually addressed that now, but it doesn't really change the fact that the entire time I was playing, I was thinking to myself, Th this is kind of boring for me. And so I really just can't necessarily recommend it. Even if you like those genres of ARPGs or like the Minecraft kind of game, this doesn't really do either of those things as well as other examples in those individual genres. Number 27 is Katana Zero. This is also a really interesting idea of being a ninja and going through, like, room by room, taking out all the guys before they can hit you the once, because one hit and you're done. Now, that's a neat idea, especially because you have conversations in this game and you can have different conversation options, but they have a little bit of fun with it. You can answer early before the little timer goes down, and it will say things like, No time! Stop talking to me! I, I like that. I thought that that was really cute. Uh, when you get into those rooms and you're, you're trying to take them out before you get even hit the once, I felt like that was a little bit much. And also, I didn't understand why they needed to replay it for me after I did it. It just does that all, all the time. It replays the thing that you just did. Unnecessary. Honestly, it was unnecessary. Number 28 is Carto. Carto is the kind of game that conceptually sounds like a winner. You're, uh, you know, this character, and you can move tiles around, and as you move the tiles around, you change the landscape that you are on, and it unlocks new pieces as you're moving those around, and then you get new pieces. And it's kind of like a board game, almost like a Carcassonne, but in terms of, of, of a game where there's a narrative and everything. And that's real neat. But the problem is, I fell asleep playing it. And if I'm falling asleep playing it after literally like 20 minutes... We've got a problem, folks. That's not really an engaging game. And unfortunately, that's the problem that Carto falls into. Number 29, now we're getting into games that I actively dislike. Okay, <laughs> Yes, Your Grace. I don't know why this game exists. Honestly, I do not know why this game exists. I'll explain how Yes, Your Grace works. You are the king. You have a few daughters and uh, a wife... And your daughters are going through some things, and your wife is kind of there saying, well, whatever. And you have some advisors, and you got to figure out, like, your, the gameplay itself is every day, a bunch of people come in and will tell you, like, these are the resources that we need in order to do the thing that we want. Do you want to give them those resources, or do you not want to give them those resources? Okay, that's my business for the day, and then I go and I have a bunch of conversations with, like, my, my offspring... <laughs> to figure out what's going on in their lives, and then the day ends, and you start the process over again the next day. It's kind of boring. It, it's kind of boring and tedious, and I did not understand why this game existed, and they were like, you, you know, your actions are really going to affect the... I do not see how that's possible. I, I did not see how this game was going to somehow just revolutionize the idea of choice and consequence. I, I've already talked about earlier... In this episode, 
about places where real change happens when you make decisions on the fly. This did not do that for me. I felt like I was just going through a storybook with occasional times of like social management where I sit and decide, am I going to do the thing or not do the thing and see what happens later? Not enjoyable, honestly. Number 30 is Darksiders Genesis. I like the Darksiders series a lot. One, two, three, great. Darksiders Genesis is not like those. It is a boring, boring game. Honestly, it really is. I don't really know why uh, they paired War up with Strife, and I felt bad for Strife. Like, Stri like the other three horsemen got their own games, and then Strife gets saddled with the original one, so that he's going to play a backseat role. He's the gunslinger of the group. Why is he not getting top billing in his own game? But it's a top-down, more like an ARPG, but it doesn't really have, like, the, the looter-shooter mechanics that you might enjoy from, like, a Diablo. It feels way more like, you know, okay, go here, do this, do that, kill these uh, enemies, the, these, these are demons, okay, and then go to this point, you get to this checkpoint, good, moving on. It's very by the numbers, to the point where I didn't know if I was playing a game or if I was just going a series of activities that I was supposed to do from point A to point B. Not my favorite thing in the world. Very, not recommended. The other Darksiders, though, play those. Genesis, no. Number 31 is the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance Tactics. Way earlier on this list, I was talking about Gears Tactics, and hey, I was also talking about Wasteland 3. Hey, those, those are games that have some tactic-based combat, and it works real well. What they do in Dark Crystal Age of Resistance Tactics is they take what is a fantastic show that you should definitely watch if you have Netflix, and they turn it into these very small little sections where you have to beat up a couple people with some very basic move sets and then move on to the next set piece over and over and over again. That's basically what you're supposed to do. And it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. None of the characters and their personalities show through. It has none of the charm of the series uh, and none of the innovation of the series. And I feel like it did a disservice to Dark Crystal Age of Resistance in general. Number 32 is Elder Scrolls Blades, which I remember playing way earlier than this, but technically it got its release, its actual official release in 2020. So, hey, here it is. Yeah, Elder Scrolls Blades is a, a tarnishing mark on the rest of the Elder Scrolls series. It is a mobile game that they tried to turn into something much bigger. Like, oh wow, this is going to revolutionize mobile gaming. No, it's just more of the same mobile gaming. It doesn't do a very good job at trying to be like an action, adventure, RPG that you can play on your phone. And instead feels like more more of a uh, a hack and slash shooting gallery as you're going just down linear pathways and then fleshing out your town your hub world like you have to do in basically every other mobile game that just wants you to buy their premium currency and it falls into that same category every single time it's a real shame because it should have been something really cool if they could have given a real elder scrolls experience but maybe in the mobile market, that would have been great. I know that Bethesda's capable of it because they had something innovative when they did, like, Fallout Shelter. They could have done something innovative here, but instead, they just really want to get your microtransactions. And I say nay. I say nay to that. And number 33, scraping the bottom of the barrel, is Wasteland Remastered. Yes, that's right. We started with a Wasteland game, and we are going to end with a Wasteland game. If Wasteland 3 is the best of the year, Wasteland Remastered is most definitely the worst of the year. Imagine taking a 30-year-old game and saying, we're going to remaster it with some new graphics that only look 20 years old. And hey, we're going to keep the gameplay exactly the same. So you wind up with some great encounters where you have like a snot-nosed kid and you've got to determine what you're going to say to that kid. You don't get options. No, you have to type it in. If you're on a console, you are not going to be happy. When you get into the actual combat, there's all of these options and you don't even know what any of those options are supposed to do. I couldn't even tell when 
with one character was up and the other character wasn't. And then my characters will, would all end up unconscious. And, and then they just like bounce back and I'd be back. And I, I was so confused as to what I was supposed to do that after about 15 minutes, I got so frustrated and angry that this thing existed that I had to not play it anymore and, and, and cursed it to this very day. I don't like this idea of taking a game that's very, very old and saying that you're going to remaster it, but basically all of the gameplay and important bits that are out there are still exactly the same. I know that they could do better. They could have done a formula like they did with Wasteland 2 and 3 and do that for Wasteland Remastered where it was actual tactical combat. They instead decided to do the scroll down lists of different tactics that you can use in panels where you have a version of the giant superflies and rats that are just slightly better pictures than they were probably in the 80s when this originally came out. A very sad, sad example of a remaster. The, the worst way to do a remaster where it doesn't even feel like a remaster. It feels like a trying to cash in. Maybe they were trying to do it because they were drumming up excitement for Wasteland 3. Wasteland Remastered just puts a blemish mark on the entire series, and I, I really wish that they had not done it, honestly. It's the kind of game that probably would have been better if it had not existed. So yeah, there's uh, 33 games that I played from 2020, ranked best to worst. Uh, hopefully you found out about some games that you might not have known about. I'm sure there are at least a few on there that you didn't even know got released. And uh, maybe I have told you if they were worth playing or not. Uh, or maybe you didn't learn anything. Anyway, uh, as always, thank you for listening. Um, and if you are watching this on video, don't forget to dislike and unsubscribe. Uh, I don't necessarily mean that literally, but I kind of do. I don't even know anymore. Here's, here's what you do. Do what you want. You like it, you dislike it, whatever. You subscribe onto our podcast feeds, whatever you want to do. I don't, it, it's up to you. You do you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>